people he'd won over in the previous two years. At the age of 50, Indian home rule must have seemed like a distant dream. But the British Empire had a knack of offering Gandhi gift-wrapped opportunities. Events were unfolding back in London that would transform Gandhi's fortunes. In the summer of 1918, the British judge, Sir Sidney Rowlett, released a report into the danger of Indian seditious behaviour. He recommended that highly unpopular wartime legislation designed to curb unrest should be extended into peacetime. Gandhi was furious, denouncing it as a harsh betrayal of India's support for the war. It made him more determined than ever to be free from colonial rule. He prepared for what he called the greatest battle of my life. When Gandhi heard that the Viceroy had approved and signed the Rowlett Act, he moved decisively while other politicians dithered. Until now, he had been engaged in regional campaigns. This was a single issue on which he could launch a nationwide non-violent movement, deliberately opposing British authority in India. It was the start of a 28-year struggle. The leaders of the country's largest political organisation, the Indian National Congress, were lukewarm towards Gandhi and his political tactics. They warned him that the protest would get violent. But Gandhi trusted the Indian people to grasp the religious dimension to Satyagraha, that they had to be pure in their motives and even full of love for their oppressor. With Congress unwilling to support any act of disobedience, Gandhi assembled his own team to coordinate opposition to the Rowlett Act. In March 1919, Gandhi called for a nationwide hartal, a day of protest. All shops, offices and businesses were asked to close. He wrote to the Viceroy saying the protest would show that physical force was nothing compared to moral force, and moral force never fails. It was a bold statement, but after the earlier setbacks, the protest would be the first real test of Gandhi's leadership and support. On the streets of Delhi, I met up with Professor Mridula Mukherjee, who has studied the campaign of 1919. I wanted to know just how successful it was. Remarkably so, almost beyond everybody's expectations. It was the first nationwide political protest in Indian history. In many cities, there were meetings of over 100,000 people. So while normal activity came to a standstill, it was not that the streets were deserted. People were out on the streets, but they were in political protest. From Gandhi's perspective, was the Hartal successful? I think immensely so because the notion that people all over India could get together with minimal organization around a moral issue and protest, this was the answer he needed for his subsequent movements. The protest may have been successful in terms of turnout, but to remain true to Satyagraha, Gandhi also needed it to be peaceful. Only then would it compel the British to repeal the Rowlett legislation. But the dynamic of the protest soon changed. It turned violent. The disturbances had contradicted the spirit of Satyagraha. But far from undermining Gandhi, they would propel him into the center of Indian politics. The violence began here at the main railway station in Delhi. A large crowd supporting the protest arrived to persuade the sweet vendors on the platforms to close their stalls. The police moved in, arresting some of the demonstrators, and the crowd responded by throwing bricks. The police then opened fire, and five people were killed. The violence shocked Gandhi. 
but the situation was even worse outside Delhi. I'm on my way to the Punjab, the scene of the most violent disturbances following the day of protest. Gandhi attempted to make this same journey to calm the situation there. But his train was stopped by the British authorities and he was forcibly removed. He tried to convince them that he was traveling to stop unrest, not start it. Had he got through and succeeded in halting the violence, the course of Indian history might have been very different. At the heart of the Punjab is the city of Amritsar, home to the Golden Temple, the holiest of all Sikh shrines. The protest in Amritsar got out of hand. Mobs ran through the city. They headed for the banks here in the main street. One British bank manager tried to defend himself with his revolver, but he was murdered by the crowd. Two others were dragged out into the street and killed. The British response was swift, martial law was declared, and a general named Reginald Dyer was given control of the city. General Dyer arrived at Amritsar convinced that he had to suppress a rebellion. On the morning of the 13th of April, he issued a proclamation banning all processions and meetings. But there were many areas where Dyer didn't venture, so most people simply didn't know about the ban. That afternoon, Dyer heard that a demonstration was taking place at Jallianwala Bagh, a park in the center of the city. He headed there with 50 Indian troops. Access to the open ground in front was through just a few of these narrow alleys. General Dyer and his men walked down here and as they came to the end of the alley, they would immediately have seen the crowd gathered in front of them. There was a demonstration in the park against the roll attack. But there were also many families enjoying a religious holiday. 